G'day guys, Mac with the Our Circle, and today is the second episode in my sort of history series for the Horus Heresy. Uh, this takes place from the Unification period and the Dark Age of Technology and goes through until the Scouring. Hopefully it'll get filled out because sort of each end of that spectrum is pretty vague at the moment. Um, but something we do know a lot about is today's topic and that is the Primarchs. So in the last episode I mentioned how humanity fell in the long night and sort of the Emperor rising to power and the creation of the Primarchs. Well today we're going to look at what they are and when they were discovered, where they were discovered and how that shaped them as sort of the personalities that they are. So, first of all, the Primarchs are creatures made using the genetic template of the Emperor in some capacity, like his DNA, but modified and twisted, uh, things taken out, things added in, and psychically formed as much as physically formed. They're not just clones made in a lab. They're not just DNA taken from one source and directly replicated. They are spiritual beings as much as they are physical beings, and they are completely superhuman to the extent where some like Magnus wield insanely strong psychic powers, some might have incredible regenerative abilities like Vulcan. Uh, it really just depends. I mean, they all have incredible regeneration, but Vulcan can literally come back from the dead. So, yeah. Anyway. The first Primarch discovered was Horus, and he's the Primarch of the 16th Legion, the Lunar Wolves at that time, and he was found on the world of Sithonia. Now, this was a sort of gang-riddled world, a lot of mining shafts, that kind of thing, it was once a hub of industry, and it left an impact upon Horus and upon the people that would form the recruits of his Legion later on in life in the way that they were sort of a bit more bloodthirsty, more in your face, that kind of thing. And Horus is sort of the most balanced of the Primarchs in a lot of ways. Had an intense charisma, pretty much everyone adored him. Uh, the notable exception being uh, Corvus Corax of the Raven Guard did not like Horus for reasons that we may go into later. Now, Horus was first discovered by the Emperor, the first Primarch, and they grew really close, had this intense, insane bond. And Horus's legion, very much from the early days, was moulded in his image, because the Lunar Wolves didn't have much time to establish their own identity before he came on the scene. And that's important, because some legions spend a very long time without their Primarchs, and they uh, go through this great cultural shift when they do come across them. The Lunar Wolves are not one of those legions. Horus is there from the early days, and because of this, he is a guiding force for them and how they sort of evolve. And they fight alongside the Emperor a lot, because the Emperor wants to keep the only Primarch he's discovered close by his side. Now, an interesting sort of thing that happens here is the, the legions that don't have Primarchs, they often get sent to fight with the legions that do uh, sort of learn from them a bit. The 19th Legion, the Raven Guard, as they eventually become, are one of these forces. Another one is the Emperor's Children. So these forces end up sort of picking up bits and pieces of another legion's fighting styles. So the Sons of Horus are very much the legion, or the Lunar Wolves, the legion that sort of has the most influence over others, I guess you could say, which is sort of weird to think about. Now, the second legion to discover their Primarch is actually the sixth legion, and that is the Space Wolves, and they discover Leeman Russ on the world of Fenris. Now, this is a bit further into the Crusade than Horus being found, of course. Now, Leeman Russ ended up on Fenris, and he grew up sort of alone in the wild, which many of the Primarchs did, in fact, and was eventually uh, suckled by a wolf like Romulus and Remus of Rome, um, if things are to be believed, and eventually ends up being adopted by a Thane of a sort of Nordic household and becomes their leader. 
goes on to rule over Fenris, and eventually he's found as well, and given command of the Space Wolves. Now the Space Wolves Legion has a temperament much like Le Man Russ, and his temperament is also much like his planet, Fenris. Uh, crackly, cold, then goes through sudden shifts as the climate changes because it's an ice world, Fenris. It has this weird orbit around a star where it's completely frozen over and then the ice cracks and lava comes up and there's great tectonic energy and activity and well that's kind of what Lima and Russ's character and because he grew up in that sort of Nordic Viking type culture he revels in combat has strange bouts of what he thinks is and isn't honourable and is very headstrong so where Horace is level headed and has this charisma, this aura about him, where people just respect him and love him. Le Man Russ is kind of the opposite. He's respected, but a lot of people just think him a savage idiot. And he's happy to sort of let them think that as well. The third Primarch found is the Second Legion's Primarch, but we don't know anything about them, so we'll quickly move on. I might talk about the missing Primarchs later on. The fourth Primarch found is Ferris Manus of the Iron Hands, or the 10th Legion, and he's found on the world of Medusa. Now, much like Le Man Russ, he grows up in the wild on his own, and in the case of Ferris, however, he fights creatures in the wild and explores and discovers different things in these ruined structures on the planet of uh, Medusa. Medusa is like a wasteland world, and the people live in these moving cities and they have different gangs or clans really that roam around and come into conflict with one another over resources and technology and there's a lot of archaeotech and such scattered around and ferris he's all over that sort of stuff he's a very technological primarch and he gets into a fight with some kind of alien in the wastelands of medusa now, people think this is some sort of like Satan Shard or Necron creature because it's described as a worm of some description or a dragon. Now, I'm thinking some sort of like Tomb Stalker or something like that or something bigger than a wraith. Anyway, Ferris wrestles with this thing and eventually picks it up, carries it over and pins it underwater. Except it's not water, it's lava. He holds this thing down under lava to kill it. Now, obviously a human being can't do that, but Ferris, with his regenerating Primarch abilities, well, he can do that because he can grow back his flesh. The thing is, though, he doesn't just kill it. Whatever this creature is made of, this silvery substance, as it melts, it leeches into Ferris, and he ends up with these metallic arms, and his arms are metal, from the tips of his fingers up to sort of mid-bicep, and it's this flexible sort of substance that they're made from, and yet it's flexible but hard as diamond, and he can literally pick up molten metal and shape it in his hands, and actually will weapons into being by just squashing it with his hands, rather than using a hammer and an anvil. So, pretty cool stuff. Ferris eventually sort of becomes the overlord of Medusa, but he keeps the clan structure in place. When the Emperor does find him, Ferris is a very methodical sort of Primarch. Very taciturn, stern, keeps to himself, praises his men for good performance, but not in the kind of well done gentleman, more in the I'm not disappointed in you sort of fashion. So... It does lend um, lend to a story that I'll tell, which involves the next Primarch discovered, which is Fulgrim of the Third Legion, or the Emperor's Children. Now, Fulgrim lands on the planet of Chemnos, and Chemnos is essentially a toxic waste nightmare. So, this was once a beautiful planet, but over mining and overabundance of industry has pretty much ecologically ruined the world. And the people who discover Fulgrim. Uh, they see him as a beacon of light, a beacon of hope for their community, this sort of perfect child from the stars. And he's raised by a loving sort of family. Um, these group of workers that, you know, toil in these forges on this world of Chemos. And eventually he rises up 
becomes the leader of them and helps to rebuild that society, rebuild their infrastructure, and sort of reverse a lot of the damage done to that planet and sort of build a better world for them. And his ethos is, if I put my mind to it, I can achieve anything. I can achieve perfection. And that carries through to his legion, where they have this big perfection focus. They want to be the best at everything. Now, Fulgrim and Ferris are very different creatures. Ferris is stern, stubborn, angry. At the best, he's just silent and moody. Fulgrim, on the other hand, is always laughing and covering himself in jewels. And they're total opposites of one another. Fulgrim's this showy, mouthy, uh, arrogant son of a bitch. And Ferris is just this grump in the back corner. You know, a guy at the, at the nightclub who just sits there going, I wish I was at home. Anyway, the two of them actually meet one another on Terra. And they challenge each other to make the best weapon. Anyway... Fulgrim turns around and he makes a beautiful hammer. And Ferris, he makes a sword that has its own flame. And when they show each other their weapons after seven days of toiling, they each declare the other's weapon the winner. They trade weapons and somehow become best friends. And Fulgrim, um, he actually gives the nickname of the Gorgon to Ferris Manus because he calls him such a terrible Gorgon for being such a moody son of a bitch all the time. Interesting stuff. So the next Primarch discovered is Vulcan of the Salamanders Legion. That's the 18th Legion. Now Vulcan is discovered on the volcanic world of Nocturne and Vulcan is very different to the other Primarchs. Where the other Primarchs look like you and I, Vulcan has skin as black as midnight now, I'm not talking, like, Sudanese, African, that kind of skin colour. Remove concepts of race from your head. No, this is a person who has skin that is pitch black, like coal, like black oil, black plastic, something like that. Is ridiculously dark skinned. And almost like if he closed his eyes, he would just disappear at midnight. And his eyes are glowing bright red eyes and yet for this Vulcan has the kindest nature of all the Primarchs despite the fact he looks like a literal demon Vulcan is raised by a blacksmith on the world of Nocturne because being a volcanic world all these beautiful gemstones and uh, valuable metals are coughed up all the time by the volcanoes and there's a sort of smithing society there now unlike the other sort of Primarchs this is quite a young world uh, like the or the technology level I should say of the people on this world is quite low you know maybe middle ages crossbows medieval knights that sort of technology level but without the horses as far as I know anyway Vulcan is raised by a blacksmith and one day a dark Eldar raid happens apparently it happened quite a lot on Nocturne Vulcan goes out and Dark Eldar are like, yep, give us a few slaves, and we'll let the rest of you live. Vulcan isn't having none of that. He just picks up a couple of hammers that are lying around and just goes to town on the Dark Eldar, who are horrified to find out that you can't kill a Primarch with splinter weapons. Uh, especially not Vulcan, who's probably the toughest of the Primarchs. He goes to town and just slaughters these Dark Eldar, because he is faster than them, believe it or not, because of his superhuman abilities, and, well, he's a fucking Primarch. And, yeah, the Dark Eldar decide, fuck that, we're not coming back to Nocturne ever, after he just minces through them a few times. So, he's discovered by the Emperor, and he actually meets his prime uh, Legion whilst they're in the middle of a battle. He comes to them with reinforcements, and that's how he joins his Legion. And Vulcan is just an all-around good guy. No one has anything bad to say about him, they all love Vulcan. And, like Ferris Manus, he's of course a smithing Primarch very technologically focused makes weapons and things like that but whilst ferris makes weapons that are designed purely for functionality vulcan prefers the artistry of making them you know ferris might make a gun that is just brilliant you know really smooth operating features that kind of thing vulcan's like man i'd love to make a gun 
with a lot of ornamental artwork on the side of it because just wouldn't that be the neatest so um yeah that's vulcan the next primarch found is the primarch of the seventh legion the imperial fists and that's rogal dawn and he's found on the ice world of inwit now unlike fenris inwit's a lot more stable in climate yes it is an ice world but it's neither here nor there really rogal is raised by um, a sort of father figure and eventually takes over after he passes on and this is a world that's actually pretty technologically advanced and Rogal sort of grows this miniature empire I guess you could say of a few different worlds and he does this from an ancient ship they find in orbit called the phalanx and the phalanx is sort of this broken down relic of a past time and he's a massive massive starship and him he gets it going again and that's sort of his base of operations and when the emperor finally meets him he offers the phalanx and his service to the emperor now i haven't sort of gone through the different stories of the primarchs and how they present themselves to the emperor but that's one i just have they all have an interesting story of how they challenge the Emperor generally. Uh, like Leman Russ challenges the Emperor to a drinking competition. Uh, Vulcan challenges the Emperor to a feat of strength, that kind of thing. Well, in Rogal Dawn's case, he's just like, yep, you're the Emperor. Here's the Phalanx, and here's the worlds of the Inwit Cluster. Rogal Dawn, his character is basically stern and emotionless, uh, with violent bouts of rage sort of just kept in check by his own stubbornness and that translates pretty well to his own legion nothing particularly special about them um they do sort of tend towards siege warfare but yeah there's nothing they're not as specialized as other legions get which is what i find interesting they sort of get pushed into that siege warfare category but they, they're just at home doing anything basically the next Primarch found is probably the most famous, apart from Horus, and that's Rabute Gilliman of the Ultramarines, the 13th Legion. Now, Gilliman is raised on the planet of Macrag by paternal father figure again, and does have a sort of mother figure in his life. His father figure is essentially a consul, just like in ancient Rome, and holds power alongside another guy. That other guy decides one day to overthrow Gilliman's father, kill him, stage a coup, and raise arms. Gilliman doesn't take this, however, raises his own army, and completely crushes the other guy, becoming the ruler of Macrag. Now, Macrag is another world that's very sophisticated technologically, and Gilliman really does grow his own empire. Uh, quite a big one, in fact, conquers quite a large area of space with his more primitive ships than what the Imperium has. And when the Emperor eventually hears about this guy who's conquered a large patch of space for himself, he's like, yeah, that's got to be one of my sons. So he ventures there and meets up with Gilliman, and needless to say, very impressed. Because where, you know, he finds Liman Russ living in a fucking mud hut. Uh, he finds Gilliman running his own pseudo-empire perfectly ready to join the Imperium. And yeah, that pleases him, we'll say. The next Primarch found is Magnus the Red of the 15th Legion, the Thousand Sons. Magnus is the real weird one. He is bright red, so where Vulcan had the black skin, all the other Primarchs sort of look like you and I. Magnus has bright red skin and only one eye. Or two, it depends. Because Magnus is more psychic than physical compared to the other Primarchs, and his shape does shift according to the person perceiving him and his own will. Sometimes he has two eyes, sometimes he has one eye, but eventually he becomes Magnus the One-Eyed. He does this because he sort of strikes a deal with Zetch unknowingly in order to prevent his children, the Thousand Sons Legion, from being overcome by basically becoming Chaos Spawn. You see, their gene seed is unstable, and if they use too much psychic power, they have a tendency of mutating and deforming into mindless creatures. So Magnus basically sells his soul to save them, unknowingly. He also has a crazy red hair scheme, kind of like Blanca in uh, 
Street Fighter games, that kind of thing. Yeah, it's it's just Google Magnus the Ren. You'll be like, oh, what a weirdo. But anyway, his ability is Psychic. He's a lot like Gilliman in that he creates the sort of perfect world, but he doesn't create an empire. He just creates the one perfect city, essentially Tizka on Prospero. And this is a world that it's so well organized and so perfect that Gilliman himself says that he's jealous of what Magnus achieved. But at the same time, Gilliman creates his own mini empire, Magnus creates one city, so. <laughs> but Magnus is the Primarch of the Thousand Suns, which are a psychic legion. And Magnus actually creates the different psychic disciplines. The thought comes to him one day when he looks at these broken fragments of a statue on a beach. He comes up with pyromancy and biomancy and telekinesis and these different schools and sort of codifies and creates psychic disciplines and explains to humanity, the psychers of his world, how to safely use these powers, how to use the warp to your own advantage. Because the warp isn't as bad in this time period as it becomes in 40k. It's a little bit more controllable because the demons are waiting. They don't just want to leap out yet and cause havoc. They're biding their time. So Magnus creates these psychic disciplines and instead of just using whatever power comes to you, as it were, he actually teaches it and becomes a skill that people learn and they're able to use it willingly. He's a very balanced sort of uh, Primarch but has an absolute vain arrogance and his thirst for knowledge and esoteric artifacts leads him off the track constantly. Instead of sticking to the job that has to be done, he's easily lured away by shiny things. The next Primarch found is the Angel Sanguinius of the Ninth Legion Blood Angels. He's called the Angel because he has a set of wings that make him look like an angel, and long golden flowing hair, and he's found on the devastated world of Baal. Now Baal was once a paradise world, but during the Age of Strife and the Dark Age of Technology was purged by some sort of weapon, radiological weapon. And the survivors lived in a sort of Mad Max society with normal people living alongside mutants and going to war with them constantly. And they stumble across, uh, across this beautiful sanguineous child in an, a pod, crashes into the world. And they think we should kill him like the other mutants, but then they think, something, something special about him. Let's, let's raise him. And they do, and Sanguinius is pure of heart and does right by the people of Baal and raises them up, much like Fulgrim did with Chemos. But unlike Fulgrim, Sanguinius is not arrogant. He's constantly aware of his sort of fate. He feels like he can fail at any moment and he's doing his best to avert it at all costs. So that marks him in stark contrast to Fulgrim, who sort of has this vain glory, this arrogance that constantly sort of pulls at him. The next Primarch found is Lionel Johnson of the Dark Angels, the First Legion. Now the Dark Angels by this point, they're sort of, sort of starting to wonder, you know, we're the biggest Legion, we were the First Legion, where the fuck's our Primarch? And they come across this medieval world of forests called Caliban. And it just so happens that it's run by a guy called Lionel Johnson, the son of the forest. And he just happens to be the head of a knightly order called, well, the Order. And he has recently pacified the world because he created a group of knights alongside his sort of father figure and mentor, Luthor. And together they go around and conquer the planet, sweeping away these other knightly orders and killing the horrible mutated deformities of chaos that lived in the woods of the planet. And when the Dark Angels arrive on that world, he's presented to them and in pretty short order takes over. Now, unlike the other Primarchs, like Gilliman, who's a sort of organizer of things, um, Magnus, who's a psyker, Vulcan, who's a smith, Lionel Johnson's just a jack of all trades. He's just great at everything, and I mean fantastic at everything. Although he doesn't use psychic powers, he understands that he can hurt creatures that are weak against psychic powers. He's a strategist, a tactician, 
and a formidable fighter in combat. It's pretty much a sort of toss-up between Sanguinius and the Lion who will win. Horus will beat them all if he's Chaos Supercharged, but it's pretty much just Sanguinius or the Lion when it comes to raw feats of arms. Now the Lion's nature is a very reserved one. He's prone to anger, stubbornness, stern, very much like Ferris Manus or Rogal Dawn. The Lion's very untrusting as well because he grew up alone in the forest and this is a place where grown men were afraid to venture in groups and he grew up alone as a child in this forest and killed things. Anything that tried to kill him, he killed. It's pretty crazy and you can find out a lot more about it in the novel so I won't go into it too much. But he has a very interesting backstory and quickly takes over the Dark Angels Legion and his sort of father figure Luthor is also inducted into the Legion. The next Primarch found is Perturabo of the 4th Legion, the Iron Warriors. He grows up on the world of Olympia, and Olympia is sort of like ancient Greece. It's a world of different city-states with that sort of lower level of technology, and he's raised by a tyrant, sort of a dictator of sorts who runs one of the city-states, and he just does his bidding. Now the problem with Perturabo is, Perturabo wants nothing more than to explore, invent and build things. And unfortunately he never gets that chance in life, because he's always called upon to do tasks he doesn't want to do. And this in turn, along with the constant backstabbing nature of these city-states, very much makes him a very bitter and very paranoid Primarch who always thinks someone's sort of out to get him. And that's not a good combination for a superhuman. But Perturabo is a very, very logical person. Everything he does in warfare is like a game of chess for him. He's moving the pieces on the board. And he understands technology and building things and creating things. It just comes naturally to him. He has a photographic memory for technology. It all interests him, but he doesn't really get to apply it, which is a bit of a shame. And when he's greeted by the Iron Warriors, one of the most famous events of the Great Crusade takes place because he looks at their past records, and unlike Primarchs like Horus, who's been able to sort of mentor his sons from the very first moment, well, Perturabo looks at their records and goes, yeah, you guys haven't performed up to my standards, so I'm going to need you to kill one in every ten blokes with your bare hands. Sorry about that. He decimates his own legion, in other words. Every 10th Iron Warrior is beaten to death by the Iron Warriors around him with their bare hands or maybe even sticks like ancient Rome. It's mustache twirlingly evil and it's only a sort of recent addition to the fluff. But yeah, very worth mentioning. In any case, he takes command of that legion and Gilliman sort of has a go at Perturabo over it. You can't do that, those are good legionnaires. And Perturabo just tells him to blow off essentially so yeah the iron warriors stern maybe a bit aggressive much like their father very analytical the next legion discovered of the 14th legion the death guard and their primarch is mortarian who's pretty much the grim reaper you see he crash lands on the toxic planet of barbarous where the atmosphere can kill a person and there are very few safe areas you can live on the planet and it's covered in these horrible swamps full of poisonous and vile creatures. It's a death world, Barbarous. Mortarion is found by a alien, possibly demonic entity, who raises him as his own son. Mortarion eventually, however, escapes and finds out that the pathetic slaves and people doing the bidding of this tyrant living in the swamps below are humans like him, and he decides to take up arms and join them. And eventually, he sort of forms his own armies with pseudo sort of power armor. And they kill off all of the tyrants across this planet, except for his foster father. And when he finally goes, today's the day I'm going to kill this guy, the emperor arrives. And the emperor says to him, hey, join me. And of course, he's like, no, nah, screw you, I'm my own boss, I'm going to kill him. And the emperor says, okay, if you can kill him... 
you don't have to join me. But if you can't kill him, I will, and you'll have to join me. So Mortarian's like, fine, I'll do it. And starts trudging up this tall mountain to try and get to the guy. Well, even the Primarch Mortarian, he can't take the gases and the toxins that swirl through the atmosphere on this planet. And he climbs this mountain, his armor disintegrating off him, his clothing wastes away, and he's just left Mortarian, naked, blistered, choking on the gases on the ground, and his foster father walks out to deliver the killing blow. At this point, the Emperor teleports in, kills the foster father, and rescues Mortarian. Mortarian, though, holds a grudge for this. He felt it was his right to kill his foster father, not the Emperor's. The Emperor took that away from him. Now, the Death Guard are another legion like the Iron Warriors, where the Terrans, the ones who were born and raised and have fought through the Great Crusade from Earth all the way out to the wider galaxy, have a very, very different nature, a different set of uh, rituals and such that they like to perform compared to the ones born on Barbarus. And this is a real rift in the Legion. The Terrans get the crap jobs, driving the tanks and the armor, that kind of thing. Whereas those born on Barbarus get the favorable ranks, they get promoted up faster and all that sort of deal. And it's quite a problem for the Death Guard because it causes some real splits within them later on. Instead of being a united whole who work together, they actually are a rather fractious lot. Don't get along well with others. The next Primarch found is Lorgar of the Wordbearers on the world of Colchis. Now, the 17th Legion, the Wordbearers, are basically religious nut jobs. They had a religion on their homeworld, and Lorgar rose to be sort of the preeminent prophet of this religion. And the other priests around him, like Erebus and Corferon, who was the previous sort of head, they uh, raised up with him into the legions. And Lorgar brings this same religious zeal to his legion. And he's like, there's a higher power, there's a god, da 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 da. This god is going to visit us, and eventually the emperor lands there and they go, well, look at you, you must be a god. You're a glowing golden guy who can perform miracles. You're a god. And this sort of confirms their religious beliefs. Lorgar has this unabiding trust and belief in divinity. That's his strength, his, just his willpower and trust and belief, faith. The Emperor, of course, is like, I'm not really a god, guys. Um, I mean, I have power, but I'm not a god. I'm a man, like you. I don't want religions. I want atheism, because religion, that's bad. Of course, he doesn't state why he thinks that's bad at this point in time, just that it's bad. And, of course... The word bearer is like, nah, you're a god, and they worship him anyway. And they spread this relief. They create the imperial cult. Lorgar writes the equivalent of the Bible, which is used from 30k right through 40k by people, all about their faith and their belief in the emperor and his divine light. The emperor, ironically, is like, this is a load of crap. <laughs> I'm not interested in this, Lorgar. And they spread this faith to different worlds. Until such time as the emperor turns around, he says... Stop doing it, uh, which we'll talk about another time, but that creates a rift with Lorgar. The next Primarch found is one of the more interesting and more secretive, surprisingly, Primarchs, and that's Jagatai Khan of the 5th Legion, the White Scars, on the world of Mundus Planus, or Chagoris, as they call it. He's essentially Genghis Khan. He and the White Scars Legion are all about speed, mobility, hard hitting, get in, kill your enemies, get the job done, get out of there. And this sort of gives them a barbaric look to outsiders, much like the Space Wolves. And the White Scars are happy to go along with this, to some degree, because they're like, yeah, we are brutal and savage. But, on the other hand, they also do calligraphy, poetry, they write songs, they do artwork, they wear silks in their time off. They're a very cultured legion, they just believe that the fighting, when it's there to be done, just get in there, get it done, enjoy it, you only live life once. And they have this real, you know, they smile and laugh as they go into combat. They think it's great. 
it's just part of their culture and when they're not in combat they're like great we're not in combat let's focus on culture and art and life and they enjoy those things and unfortunately this perception grows up about them just being mindless savages which they sort of resent but they're too proud to go out there and correct people because they're like well if anyone gave a fuck about us and learned more about us they know these things the only ones who actually care to learn about them are Horus, who's again beloved by all, and Magnus the Red of the Thousand Suns, who I guess as an outsider himself probably finds a bit of a kindred spirit in Jagatai Khan. And Jagatai of course is raised in the steps of his world much like Genghis Khan and the sort of Chinese equivalent of that world who live behind a great wall and are very technologically sophisticated raid his lands and he eventually crushes them in battle and takes over the world he doesn't like the whole idea of having to rule a planet however he's a conqueror he's like you know you can't build walls forever there's no point sitting behind ruins and growing fat on an empire i want to go out among the stars and keep conquering and just so happens at that moment the emperor arrives and he's like great perfect timing let's get started the next primark discovered is Conrad Kurz of the Night Wards, the 8th Legion, and he hails from a planet called Nostromo, which is a sort of wink-wink at Nostromo, the spaceship from the first Alien film. Now, Nostromo is a world that's permanently in nighttime because it's near a dying star, which provides very little light. It's a gang-riddled world with a sort of hierarchy of cruel mob bosses who push the people around below them and life is generally absolutely horrible. Comrade Kurz grows up on the streets of this world living off eating rats and things like that and haunted by nightmares of the wars to come in his future. Haunted by thoughts of his own death and the deaths of his brothers who he hasn't met yet. So it's safe to say he's a few cans short of a six pack from the get go. Comrade Kurz decides that hey this planet's pretty messed up there's no war how's about I make my own and he's a horrible murdering vigilante who will skin whole families just to teach one person in that family not to steal bread to feed their starving children yeah that's the night haunter that's Conrad Kurz so eventually the Emperor and a couple of other Primarchs all arrive together and Conrad Kurz meets them and the Emperor takes away his sort of pain and visions for a time performs this miracle on him and Comrade Kurz goes on to rule the Night Lords. Now, the Night Lords Legion, unlike the others, they recruit mostly career criminals and horrible people into their ranks. Not deliberately, but because it just so happens that, funny enough, on a planet that's malnourished and that kind of thing, well, the ones who are corrupt and decadent and in with the criminal crowds are able to get a hold of the food and that kind of thing, they produce the strongest you know, offspring, it makes perfect sense. And they're the ones who end up getting recruited into his legion. And ironically, despite being all about the war and doing the right thing, he ends up surrounded by a legion of psychopaths and serial killers. Which, again, the guy's already a few cans short of a six-pack. Do you really need to send them out to conquer the galaxy? So, yeah. The next Primarch discovered is Angron of the World Eaters on the world of Nuceria the 12th Legion. Now Nisiria is actually inside ultramarine space and it's completely unknown to McCrag and to Gilliman that Angron's on this world. But Angron lands in his pod as a child and is immediately ambushed by a group of soldiers. Some stories say it was Eldar, some say it's a group of different soldiers from one of the settlements. In any case, slaughters the fuck out of them, even as a child. He's then captured, however, and they perform a surgery on him where they implant a set of what they call the Butcher's Nails, a sort of archaeotech device that they don't really understand how it works, but they know they can make them. And they implant this into his skull. And essentially, it causes him incredible agony unless he has certain emotions, namely rage. So as long as he's really pissed off and fighting things, he doesn't feel too much pain, and he can live a normal life. But of course, 
normal life means not fighting things and he feels incredible pain and he's always wincing in agony and he's just an angry bastard. Now, this sort of clouds his character. What kind of a person would Angron have been if this hadn't been done to him? Nobody quite knows because the Warhounds, the World Eaters as they were known, the Warhounds are brutal but controlled aggression sort of legion. They're actually more controlled in how they put their aggression out there than the Space Wolves, who are sort of, again, something they're compared to. And this particular force under Angron are also implanted with the Butcher's Nails over time. And again, it changes their character, and they're not what they once were. That controlled aggression is just lost. In any case, Angron becomes the Spartacus of his planet. He leads a slave uprising, a revolt because he's forced to fight in the fighting pits of this planet for the amusement of the rich. Now, his revolt, it's devastating. And eventually, however, seven different armies from around this world converge on him, on him at once, sort of corner them in this part of the planet, in this sort of canyon area. And he knows this is the end, and, yep, I'm ready to fucking do this. The Emperor comes down to him, teleports in at that moment, he's like, Angron, you don't have to do this. Join me, I'll save your people blah blah blah, and Angron's like, go get fucked, I don't care about your Imperium, I'm gonna die here. The Empress sort of sighs and says, that won't do, and just teleports him out of there against his will. And Angron's people are all slaughtered without him. Needless to say, for a guy that pretty much only feels rage, this drove him over the edge. Angron loses his shit, and when different members of his legion are sent in to calm him down, because the Emperor fucks off like a responsible father he is, Angron just goes about murdering his own captains until eventually Khan, who becomes the betrayer, convinces him to settle the fuck down and that the world hounds slash world eaters as they'll become, well, they're worth fighting with and fighting for. Khan's old uh, legion name themselves the world eaters, or well, Angron gives them that name after his old slaves who were the Eaters of Cities, well, the World Eaters are the Eaters of Worlds. They're sort of named in their honour. Anyway, the next Primarch discovered is Corvus Corax of the Raven Guard, the 19th Legion, and he's found on the world of Deliverance. Now, this is actually a moon of another planet. I believe it's called Kevar, but I'll have to double-check it. In any case, he's actually crash lands inside a prison colony and is raised by the inmates of the prison. Now, Korax could either go down the Comrade Kerr's route of bringing his own sort of justice and order to the place, he could go a very blunt and direct approach like someone like Luman Russ might and just fuck this, I'm going to overturn this city and conquer it. Instead, he is the sleuthing and stealthing type. He's actually taught patience, taught to actually suss out the enemy, see what they do, anticipate their reactions, corner them, perform surgical strikes. Fighting guerrilla warfare is what he's taught by the prisoners, and eventually when he does lead his uprising, he masterfully does it, you know, cuts off security guards, isolates them, takes weapons at the right time. Perfectly masterful job that he does. And it's at this time that the Emperor arrives, and Korax he says to him basically, hey, I want you to end the fighting here, resolve the situation, make everything more peaceful, and I'll fight for you. And the Emperor's pretty pleased by this. He's like, yeah, it's a pretty selfless approach. Yep, you're cool, Korax. And the Raven Guard. The Raven Guard at this time, this is very late in the Great Crusade, believe it or not. About 150 years in. So the Raven Guard have spent most of their time as the dust-clad fighting alongside the Sons of Horus, or the Lunar Wolves. And their fighting style is that is a savage, barbaric fighting style. Deep down inside, the Raven Guard are actually horrible monsters, it could be said. They get white skin, like whiter than chalk, and they have eyes like a shark's, just solid black. They can be terrifying. And... Korax sees the worst in his legion, and he basically just sends them off into the void. He's like, yeah, you guys are the worst of the worst. Just please go away, and never come back. And the remainder of the legion, he rebuilds in his new image, which is a stealthy legion. 
The next Primarch found is the Primarch of the 11th Legion, and he's unknown. The last Primarch found is the Primarch of the 20th Legion, the Alpha Legion. Now, technically, this is twins, a pair of Primarchs, Alpharius and Omegon, which is, again, more recent fluff. It was something that was established in the novel Legion, to my knowledge. It was never something present in the older fluff, and I, I kind of am not a fan of it, but it is what it is. We'll cover it anyway. Alpharius, we know nothing about his backstory, only that eventually, late in the Crusade, as Sons of Horus Cruiser is moving along through space and gets lured into an ambush and immobilized. Horus himself comes to the aid of this ship and his own ship ends up getting boarded by a group of mismatched small craft. And on this small craft, one of the people is Alpharius and he fights his way all the way to the bridge of the ship. And when he stumbles in face to face with Horus, they recognize one another as brothers, and Horace laughs to himself because he's discovered the final Primarch. Now, Horace doesn't straight away send word back to the Emperor on Terra that he's found Alpharius. Instead, Alpharius stays with him for a while and the two learn from one another, and Horace sort of, you know, pulls Alpharius towards his side in this time. In any case, Alpharius still doesn't let Horace know where he came from. Which is interesting, he wants to keep his secrets still, he doesn't trust him fully. So, with that, the Alpha Legion are kind of like the Raven Guy in that they perform those surgical strikes, those stealth ops, that kind of thing. The only thing is that because they come into the Crusade so late, they have a bit of an arrogant streak on their side. Because early on, Alpharius and Gilliman have a bit of a confrontation. Not coming to blows or anything like that, but Alpharius states to Gilliman that you know he can perform these surgical strikes and has this excellent form of efficient warfare and Gilliman basically says yeah well look at how many victories I have under my belt you know get good scrub and Alpharius gets a big chip on his shoulder and goes out of his way to prove how much more efficient than Gilliman he is by creating scenarios and campaigns and making them ridiculously hard for himself letting enemy armies entrench themselves and fortify whole cities before Alpharius flicks on his plan and takes them down overnight. He's like, look, look how much the enemy prepared for me and they still weren't ready for me. And everyone basically is like, yeah, we don't care. <laughs> so Alpharius has that chip on his shoulder the whole time. Anyway, the missing Primarchs, what's the go with those, I hear you say? Well, to round out the episode, the missing Primarchs were the 2nd and 11th Legion's Primarchs. They did something to dishonor themselves or disgrace themselves, because no one will talk of them, and their statues on Terra are shrouded. So nobody knows quite what they did, whether they rebelled against the Emperor, whether they fell in battle against alien entities, whether they just disappeared. No one's quite sure. It's hinted at in different scenarios that other Primarchs know what happened, or even that Leman Russ might have been directly responsible for killing at least one of them. But nothing is really known. Apparently, they might have been involved in the Rangda genocides, which, again, pretty cool sounding thing, but we don't know anything about it. So, might be something, might be nothing. But apparently, the Rangda genocides basically saw the first legion go from being the biggest legion to one of the smallest the dark angels really copped a beating in it so are going to be a pretty interesting story in there anyway mac with the outer circle hope you all enjoyed this episode about the primarchs this is just a very quick overview of them i simplified a lot of things really sort of mm, tried to give you just the beats the rough beats you know I highly encourage you to read the Primarch novel series or even the novels for each legion so you can find out more about them and fill in some of their backstory. And the Black Books from Forge World do a very good job of establishing the Primarchs where they grew up and the character of their legions. So well worth looking into if that sort of thing interests you. Of course there's always Wikipedias of different kinds, that kind of thing, but I don't want to give you the wiki. If you can go and look at it online somewhere, why am I telling you it? You know, like, this is just my view of things. 
Thank you all for watching the episode, and I'll see you all next time.